as inflation came down from the early 1980s, then interest rates came down. And as interest rates came down, that made credit more affordable. So credit exploded. So suddenly this money revolution was sparked off when dollars stopped being backed by gold. The Fed was free to print. The US had disinflation because of globalization. And the government could spend a lot of money without worrying about overstimulating the economy too. And the Fed could help finance it by printing even more money and credit exploded. So all of these things together constituted a money revolution that literally transformed the world. And for one thing, pulled hundreds of millions of people around the world out of poverty. Madison Wigan, and these are the Wigan Sessions. Today, joining me on the show is an old friend, Richard Duncan. Richard is the author of four best-selling books, Analyzing the Causes and the Effects of Economic Crises, and why these crises have brought the global economy to the brink of collapse over and over during the last decades. His latest book, The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century, describes the evolution of money and credit over the last century and the transformation of our economic system from capitalism to what he calls creditism, a transformation that occurred over the five decades since the dollar ceased to be backed by gold. Richard also publishes MacroWatch, a video newsletter he founded in 2013. MacroWatch is available at his website, richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. In today's session, we jam about Richard's lifelong love affair with Asia. He's actually speaking with us today from his farm in northern Thailand. We discuss Richard's new book, The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. Richard and I share a publisher in John Wiley and Sons, and we cover many of the same macroeconomic topics, even if we don't necessarily come to the same conclusions. Richard gives us some historical background on the Fed and explains the origin of our current inflationary environment. We then have a rousing discussion of annual government deficits and the ever-rising national debt, now over $31 trillion. We discuss the absurdity of calling it the debt ceiling and the political theater that goes along with raising it every year or so now. It's actually been raised 74 times since 1960. So why they call it a ceiling at all is an absurdity. We also discuss why Richard is not worried about a rising national debt at all. It's a curious position to take. That said, we discuss the difference between good government debt, like research and development, and bad government debt, like stimulus checks and money printing to prop up the stock market. Richard explains why he thinks the Fed will not issue a Fed coin, a cryptocurrency backing the dollar anytime soon. They've been studying the issue since 2018, and they continue to study it, but he thinks it wouldn't be in their interest to issue one. Then we cap off our discussion with what individual investors should do to navigate the current macroeconomic environment. Ready? Let's jam. Welcome, Richard. It's good to see you again. As I said, the last time we sat down together was probably five or six years ago. Here in Baltimore, we had lunch and we were catching up then and we're catching up again today. Welcome. Thank you, Addison. It's great to see you again. Thank you for in inviting me onto your podcast. As I said, you're in northern Thailand. Maybe just describe why you're there and uh, kind of fill readers in on where you're coming from. So uh, I am an American. I, I grew up in Kentucky and went to Vanderbilt. But after that, I had a great stroke of luck and was able to backpack around the world for a year. And so in early 1984, I saw Thailand for the first time and Singapore and Malaysia. And Southeast Asia was booming. So I realized, go east, young man. So after a couple of years back in business school at Babson College outside Boston, when I finished my MBA, I flew to Hong Kong and found a job as a securities analyst uh, doing research on the Hong Kong stocks. And I've spent most of my career living in Asia since then, moving around between Hong Kong and Singapore and Thailand. And uh, well, now for the last 14 years, we've been based back in Thailand for a second time. And this time, uh, in addition to having our apartment in Bangkok, we, we bought a piece of land up in Northern Thailand, outside Chiang Rai, way out in the countryside. 
it's super beautiful, surrounded by rice paddies and mountains in the distance. So, it's, and it's cool this time of the, the year. It gets down to a frigid 59 degrees in the morning here. And it's uh, sunny and cool and beautiful all day long. So it's, the winters are great up here. So that's, that's why I'm here now. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, 59 here in Baltimore in the winter sounds like uh, summertime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's get started. Um, why don't you describe your new book? Um, it, and the book comes out, the, it comes out now, right? Right. The book is out now. It, you can find it in hopefully all good remaining bookstores and of course on Amazon. It's called um, The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. And it, it spans 120 years, 110 years of history. And then it looks 10 years into the future. There, there are three parts. The first part is the history of the Federal Reserve from the time it was created. And it tells the history of the Fed in a very unique way by analyzing and tracing the changes in the Fed's balance sheet, its assets and liabilities over uh, nine consecutive periods. So by looking at the changes in the Fed's liabilities, you can see exactly how the Fed created money. And by looking at changes in its assets, you can see exactly what the Fed did with the money it created. And that's how I tell the story. Um, and then the second part is about the history of credit over the last century or so, and how our economic system has evolved from capitalism into what I call creditism. And then the final part of the book draws on the lessons of the first two parts, the history, to make recommendations about you know, to learn the lessons of that history and to make policy recommendations for how to make the future better. Um, I, I just turned in a draft of, of uh, Demise of the Dollar, which does a similar thing. I was focused mostly on um, the onset of massive inflation that we've seen just since the, the pandemic. Um, I'd like to start there. I know that you have a historical view of the Fed and how we got to where we are, and maybe you can draw on that a little bit, but um, I'd like to understand or help help uh, readers, viewers, whatever, understand how we went from an extended period of low interest rates, low to negative interest rates, um, to overnight inflation and, okay, well, and sure. historic inflation, too. Okay, so, yeah, so... Very important question. The book is called The Money Revolution because I believe that when dollars ceased to be backed by gold uh, five decades ago, that sparked off a, uh, a series of, it unleashed, it, it created a different set of circumstances that caused our economic system literally to evolve. So let me take a couple of minutes and explain this. Under When dollars were backed by gold, well, so it, up until 1968, the Fed was required to hold gold to back every, or gold certificates more technically, to back every new dollar that it issued. But by 1968, it didn't have any enough gold to issue any more dollars. And so at the behest of President Johnson, Congress changed the law and removed that requirement that the Fed hold gold to back the dollars it created. Now, this suddenly changed everything. Uh, a number of important things changed. First of all, of course, the Fed was free to create as much money as it dared because it didn't have to have any gold to back up the dollars it created anymore. But the second change is, is, is also extraordinarily important. Afterwards, trade between countries no longer had to balance. When dollars had to be backed by gold, then if the US had had a very large trade deficit, it would have had to pay for that trade deficit with gold, and it would have lost it would have lost its gold reserves, and therefore the money supply would have contracted. There would have been a terrible recession, and uh, the U.S. would stop buying things from other countries, and trade would come back into balance. There was an automatic adjustment mechanism under the gold standard or the or the gold backed money system under the Bretton Woods system that ensured that trade between countries balanced. So if you look back at in history. U.S. trade was in, essentially in balance, uh, not only in, it, it continued on through the 1970s, 
it just really became Bretton Woods. 68 was the big breaking point. 1971 was the breakdown of Bretton Woods. But by the early 1980s, the US started running massive trade deficits. Uh, by 1985, the US current account deficit was three and a half percent of GDP. And it corrected temporarily after the Plaza Accord. But by 2006, it had blown out to 6% of GDP, $800 billion in that one year alone. Now, the reason why this is so important is because it meant that the United States was able to buy things from other countries with very low cost labor. Uh, before that time, if the US government spent too much money and the Fed printed too much money, then that would have overstimulated the US economy and led to uh, full employment and full industrial capacity utilization and a wage push inflation spiral. But after we started having these massive trade deficits, which became possible when dollars were no longer backed by gold, suddenly we were able to circumvent all those domestic bottlenecks and buy things from countries with very low cost labor. So for instance, I moved to Hong Kong in 1986. Soon afterwards, I, on business trips, I would go across the border into China and see factories full of 19 year old women earning $3 a day as far as the eye could see into the horizon. And so this was extraordinarily disinflationary. And suddenly, so that was the big, the second change. As inflation came down from the early 1980s, then interest rates came down. And as interest rates came down, that made credit more affordable. So credit exploded. So suddenly this, uh, this money revolution was sparked off when, when dollars stopped being backed by gold. The Fed was free to print. The US had disinflation because of globalization. And the government could spend a lot of money without worrying about overstimulating the economy too. And the Fed could help finance it by printing even more money and credit exploded. So all of these things together constituted a money revolution that literally transformed the world. And for one thing, pulled hundreds of millions of people around the world out of poverty. As the US trade deficit became larger and larger, other countries' surpluses became larger and larger. And this, for one example, completely transformed China and turned China, changed China from being a very poor country when I first saw it, a poor developing country in the mid eighties into being now the, the global superpower nipping at our heels. Um, and along the way pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So that, that was the good side of this transformation. The bad side is it has created a global credit bubble that is always on the verge of imploding and, and periodically starts to implode and has to be reflated, as we saw in 2008 and again in 2020. Yeah. Um, but, but about, that's the background. Uh, yeah. I haven't answered your question. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But, so so we, we see um, after 2008, we see uh, interest rates go up for a little bit, uh, but then uh, Bernanke and then Yellen behind him they, as chair, chairman of the Fed, um, chairman and woman of the Fed, um, they they were worried about in, uh, deflation, so they lowered interest rates. And we had a period of time between 12, 2012 and 2018 where rates were at zero or in real terms negative uh, in, in order to re-inflate the economy. They were trying to get that credit bubble going again, which, um, you know, uh, you were right. Yeah, <laughs> you were writing through it. I was writing through it, and we were just going, "This is crazy. This is insane. This is going to cause massive inflation at some point." And it took a pandemic to make it happen. But maybe you can walk us through, maybe from 2012 to 2021. Yeah. So, well, 2008, of course, the big bubble started to implode then, and the government responded with trillion-dollar budget deficits for four years in a row and three rounds of quantitative easing that uh, took the Fed's total assets up from one trillion to four and a half trillion by, by 2014. And despite those extraordinarily large government budget deficits and all of the money that the Fed created to finance them, the highest rate of inflation we got in that period was 3.8% inflation in 2011, and by the CPI inflation. And by 2015, we actually dipped back into deflation again. And this was despite the, the base money supply increased by 
in, two, at the, in 2008, year on year, which uh, was much, much higher than anything we'd ever seen before. But that didn't result in high rates of inflation. Now, this time, um, base money in 2020 didn't increase as much this time as it did that time. This time, base money increased by, rough, I think, 80% as opposed to 150%. But, um, but there were other factors, of course. The way the money was handed out this time was quite different. The first time in 2008, it more or less went to shoring up the banks. But this time, the money was sent out directly in stimulus checks to American households and to American businesses. Households got $1.8 trillion of stimu stimulus checks. Businesses got $1.7 trillion of stimulus checks. And when people get checks, they deposit them. And so this caused bank deposits to skyrocket by about 35% uh, over a two-year period. And deposits make up part of M2, a different measure of the money supply. So M2 grew by 27% this time, whereas in 2008, that period, it peaked at only about 10%. So this was one of the major changes. And honestly, I, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see until afterwards that that had, that that had happened and the significance of that. So with all of this firepower, the Americans were locked at home and couldn't go out, had money to spend, couldn't spend it on services. So they spent it on manufactured goods like uh, new iPads and laptops and exercise machines at a time when global supply chain bottlenecks were snarled up because of COVID. And so the demand was high and the supply was messed up. That led to a burst of inflationary pressure. Well, first, of course, with the lockdowns, we had some deflation, but we came out, came out of that and went into inflation. And just when there was hope that that inflationary spell might be coming to an end, Russia invades Ukraine and causes another spike in oil and food prices and, and metal prices, et cetera. So this global supply chain bottlenecks and the invasion of Ukraine represented a partial reversal of globalization. And globalization was the main factor that had held interest rates and inflation rates down for so long. This partial reversal is largely responsible for the increase in inflation, but not entirely because all of the stimulus checks that went out to the Americans provided a lot of spending power that also bears part of the responsibility for the inflation that we've seen. Yeah, you've had the massive bank deposits or elevated bank deposits historically um, from what we had seen in the past, what, 40 years. <laughs> um, really big bump on the chart. Yeah, and it, actually, if you look at the chart, it's, it's dramatic because um, right during the pandemic year 2020 and then a little bit in the beginning of 2021, savings rates, which are bank deposits, go go way high. And consumer credit drops, which is which is uh, a, a phenomenon all of its own in the U.S. Because everybody uses credit cards and mortgages and uh, refinance their houses and they uh, take out home equity loans. We, we the entire economy is run on credit, as you as you had described as creditism. Uh, but but consumer cr credit actually went down when the pandemic hit and savings went up. So it kind of, it already had a ripple effect in the economy. It was a bizarre event for anyone who's been following it. We're like, hey, what's going on here? But then um, as the economy started opening up, the inflation rate, for the reasons you uh, you point out, it started going up. People started getting a little bit of inflation psychosis going where they're like, hey, I better buy it now because it's going to be more expensive later. And the savings rate plummets at the same time that consumer credit goes through the roof. And now we have this huge divide where people have like depleted those stimmy checks and they're just living off their credit. And which is a, a dangerous situation because uh, credit card rates have gone through the roof and all of the things like mortgages and home equity loans 
especially if they're on any kind of adjustable rate, have have increased dramatically. And I that's agree. also that that level of credit in the system is also uh, contributing to um, to inflation, and it's making it harder for the Fed to uh, tamp it down just by raising rates. Uh, and I agree, it is a it is a worrying situation. Uh, I think that Americans took their stimulus checks and paid down their credit card debt to some extent. And then once they'd gone through all of their stimulus money, now they're running up their credit card debt again. And that, that's why we're seeing this big, you know, so they're still spending or they have, they were spending up until a couple of months ago. Now it looks like it's slowing down pretty sharply. And with the interest rates moving higher, it is likely that we will have a recession before long. But I do think we have to, you know, take a balanced view. And once the decision was made to shut down the economy, then had the government not come through with these big stimulus programs, it wouldn't have taken long for, I mean, unemployment was up at 14%. It would have kept going to Great Depression levels. And with the Americans locked down, it wouldn't take long for them to start defaulting on their mortgages, their car loans, the credit cards, all their debt, which of course no bank could withstand. So the banking system would have collapsed and there would have, the unemployment would have been you know, in, in 20, 30%, and we would have had a, a very severe depression. And so through this stimulus, we did get, we did prevent that. And now the unemployment rate is three and a half percent. The economy is larger than it was before the pandemic, which is not the case in, in many countries, including Japan. And so we made it to the other side of the pandemic, but the cost has been, uh, Inflation, the CPI went up to 9%, which is quite, a, quite astonishing, something I ever expected to see. But now it looks like it's coming down again. Um, we're talking about a lot of numbers. I, I'm just curious now about your methodology, because I have my own, um, and I think mine is probably tempered with a little bit more libertarian suspicion of the government than yours. What um, When you say like 14% unemployment, or if you're talking about CPI, uh, the consumer price index at at whatever nine percent, um, what? How do you approach those? One one thing is to kind of like look at the numbers, take them with a grain of salt, and then as, extrapolate using other data um, to try to figure out what the real number is. And then another way is just to take them at face value because uh, those are the, not like if the government, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is publishing um, employment numbers, you take them at face value because those are the numbers that actually move the stock market or move uh, uh, Fed policy. So the published numbers are the ones that actually uh, cause a reaction. Um, we published a number of different economists over the years who like dig into those numbers and parse them and come up with real figures that uh, that they think the represent the, the health of the economy. One uh, one statistician that comes to mind is John Williams. Uh, he he publishes the what he calls the real inflation rate, and he's got it pegged at like twenty one percent or something right now. But but that's because he's digging under the hood and trying to rejig the numbers to to fit his hypothesis not that his hypothesis is wrong he's just looking at the numbers in a different way um that his uh his site is called shadowstats.com um and it's very interesting to read but that's not like nobody's reading john uh john john's work and then making stock market decisions or whether they buy a house or take out a mortgage or something so I'm just curious about your methodology. Like how, how do you approach the data that we get? Because that's like, especially as writers or people just um, doing YouTube, we only have one tool. And that is the, the information that we can dig up online. Right, no, I mean, I'm sure that there is a good case to be made that inflation may be higher than the government statistics. But uh, the data I use, I, I pretty much rely on the government data because that is the market information and that's what moves the market. And I, you know, I'm more, I am more government friendly than you are. I don't think that there's a huge conspiracy inside the government to cook the numbers to, you know, 
to deceive the American public. I think these people are trying to do the best job they can do. There are thousands and tens of thousands of them. And uh, some prices go up and some prices go down. For example, when I went to Hong Kong, uh, a, it used to call, cost $100 for a five minute telephone call to Kentucky. And, and now you and I are speaking for free um, with video, with a really good connection. So that's 100% deflation in telecommunication costs plus a big boost of video for free. So some prices do go up and some prices go down and they fluctuate. I mean, oil was $120 a barrel. Now it's what, 75. So there's been quite a big drop in oil prices. I, I don't think you would disagree with that. So, so I think, you know, I think the, the reported data is, is worth using as a base case since it's pretty difficult to prove any other. And even if it is somewhat too high, it's probably, I mean, too, somewhat too low, it's probably going to move in, the, in a consistent trend, maybe just a little bit above what the actual numbers are. But I'm not very disturbed that inflation is, you know, 25% and it's going to go higher. It, it looks like to me, we're going back into a period like we saw from, from 2000 until the pandemic started. The Fed couldn't hit its inflation target of 2%. The average inflation rate was below the 2% inflation target during that 20 year period because globalization is so deflationary, so disinflationary. And I believe that as if we move back into a more normal period where globalization reasserts re 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 itself, then we're probably going to be back before too long, back into a period where inflation is quite low again. Now, things could go wrong. Uh, I didn't foresee Russia invading Ukraine. If we have a war with China over Taiwan, then we're going to have very high rates of inflation and we're going to have price controls. But that's what happens during a war. Lots of other things could go wrong. But hoping for the best, hoping that things begin to return to normal, then I think we are going to see inflation come down and and after some time, interest rates will come down as well, but, but not, not immediately. I think interest rates still have some further upward uh, rate hikes ahead of us for the next few months. Yeah, um, it, it's worth me pointing out that I'm actually agnostic on the government. <laughs> I just don't <laughs> like them. I, I, I fall in the camp of I just don't like being told what to do, and I hate writing checks to them. But that's just a personal uh impediment <laughs> well i view them as um you know it's our government we are the government yeah. we just need to get the right ideas in place so that our elected officials do the right things and bring about the best outcome because you know what is what's the alternative we don't want to have a author authoritarian system like china does where one man is ruling everything yeah uh, so you know as i say democracy is the is the worst form of government except all the others. Yeah, we've right. got to work with what we've got. Yeah. Well, and also methodology-wise, I fall in the camp of, uh, of using the government statistics too, because I do believe that they're, they're the statistics that move the market. And if you want to make a cogent argument that uh, steps out of out of any kind of political philosophy, you, it, you're you uh, beholden to, to the statistics that people use you know, like I, I read uh, Bloomberg every morning, for example, and those statistics come straight out of the government books. And and that's what moves markets. People read Bloomberg and then they make trading decisions based on it. So that's been my approach for 20 something years now. Um, so anyway, just that's just a point. I was just curious how you uh, approached it. Um, let's talk about rising debt because um, e uh, as as we move into an era of creditism, debt became institutionalized within government. There used to be two parties, one that uh, encouraged government spending and one that uh, the conservatives in either party were concerned about um, the balance sheet of year over year, the deficit that we, um, we spent more money. And we have every year, we just went through another one, and every year we have the debate over raising the debt ceiling which makes you wonder why they call it a ceiling at all. It's been raised 74 times since 1960, which is just like, why call it a ceiling? 
Um, and then uh, and then those persistent deficits lead to uh, exploding national debt. It's something I've been tracking since uh, the late 90s. And every year just astounds me, especially during the pandemic. I was like, well, what are we doing? And we're, it crushes the dollar over time. And our original uh, conversations were because you had published a book on the dollar and I was working on demise, demise of the dollar. Um, and so we we became friendly because we were interpreting the same data in different ways. Um, how concerned are you about uh, the overall national debt? Right now it's at 31 trillion. When we started covering it back in the turn of the century, it was uh, 2.9 trillion. So it's gone up, what is that, 15X since then. Yeah, so if you look at the government debt, um, the latest total government debt that I've seen, it's $31.5 trillion now. I think when you published Empire of Debt in 2005, it was $8 trillion. So it's up $23 trillion since then, or 300% since in 17 years. That's the government debt. But if you look at total, government, total, not total debt, not just government debt, but household sector debt, corporate debt, and non-business corporate debt, Fannie and Freddie, and the financial sector, I, I take that into consideration as well. That puts us at $92 trillion of debt now, which is about 360% of GDP. And that number first went through $1 trillion in 1964, when I was three years old. And now it's increased 92 fold during my short lifetime. <laughs> And what I've noticed, and so this is, I believe that this explosion of credit couldn't have occurred also if we continued to be on a gold-backed monetary system. Uh, but so credit exploded and credit became the main driver of economic growth. Capitalism was driven by businessmen who would invest and some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit and accumulate capital, hence capitalism. So saving and investment was the growth dynamic under capitalism, but that's not how our system works anymore. Our system's driven by credit creation and consumption and more credit creation and more consumption. And when the private sector blows up as it did in 2008 and creditism starts to implode, then the government has to borrow and reflate the credit bubble. And so going back to 1950, any time that total credit grows by less than 2% a year adjusted for inflation, we go into recession. And the recession doesn't end until we have another big surge of credit expansion. So it takes 2% credit growth adjusted for inflation just to stay out of recession. And if credit starts to contract or contract significantly as it did start to in 2009, then we would go into a depression. And so our, our economic system now depends on credit growth to survive. If credit contracts, we will go into a depression. And I think the policymakers are aware of this. And that's why every time credit starts to contract, they increase government debt and, re and make sure that credit doesn't contract. And the Fed has played a big role in financing that by creating money and buying government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And they got away with that without having any inflation up until the pandemic and the global supply chain bottlenecks and the invasion of Ukraine and the partial reversal of globalization. So how worried am I about all of this? Well, I'm worried that the credit bubble will implode because it's quite precarious. If credit doesn't expand, our economy won't grow. And if it contracts, we go into a severe depression. But in terms of, how, is this sustainable? I think it is sustainable for if, with the right policies for some time, you know, and how long is some time? Well, it's, you know, years into the future. Our government debt now is 120% of GDP. Japan's government debt is 260% of GDP. So they've, they got where we are now about 20 years ago. And they haven't had a, a lot of economic growth but they're quite prosperous and they haven't had a depression. And the reason they haven't is because their government debt has kept growing through large budget deficits year after year, has kept their economy growing. 
their bubble popped in 1990. And now here we are in 2023 and they've avoided a depression in this way. So that's, you know, that's more than twice US government debt to GDP. So that would suggest our, our GDP is uh, what, 26 trillion. We could have another $26 trillion of government debt and before we hit the level of government debt to GDP that Japan has. And that's assuming that the economy doesn't grow at all. But if the government actually borrowed that money and invested it in new industries and new technologies, that kind of borrowing and investment would turbocharge economic growth and we'd never get to 200% government debt to GDP. The economy would grow very much more rapidly. And uh, so I'm not, so if the right policies were carried out, then we can get past this precarious position and grow our, grow our way out of this crisis. But if the wrong policies are carried out, for instance, if uh, the debt ceiling debate insists that the government contract its debt and government credit will contract, that will throw millions of Americans out of jobs. So private sector credit will contract, credit will contract, the economy will spiral into a debt deflation depression like the 1930s. So that's, the, that's what worries me, austerity. Uh -huh. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about what the right policies you think are, but um, I want to go back to the question, why do we call it a debt ceiling at all? <laughs> why not just get rid of that? The, the law was put in place in 1917, I believe, when we were getting ready to go into World War II or World War I, and the government didn't know how much money they were going to need. You go to, into war to blow shit up and like ruin things that you build and it's very expensive and the war had already gone on for four years at that point we didn't know how long we were going to be over there prior to that the government uh the congress had to stipulate how much they wanted to borrow and what it was for and then when 1917 rolled, rolled around they passed uh the what became known as the debt ceiling uh allowing congress to buy up to a certain or borrow up to a certain point without having to justify what it was for it was loosening the the purse strings so that we could go to war and then we never turned back um and then of course world war ii we blew that out of the water but in the 1950s we actually paid off a lot of that debt um it it's in uh the early 80s when reagan was trying to win the cold war that deficits became uh, a regular funding tool and then they just exploded when he, when he did win the cold war he did win the cold war um, with government deficit spending and investment in the military yeah but it just goes up from there and now it's at a point where neither party is interested in in fiscal conservative conservatism um but you're it sounds to me like what you're saying is that that's okay and I'm saying if if it's okay for us to run uh, debt to GDP ratio similar to what J Japan is running, and we cover this at length in a, a book we call the Financial Reckoning Day, under a chapter called Turning Japanese, we've been following their policies uh, since the early 90s. We were like 20 years behind them, but we're in lockstep with the way that they've managed their debt load. Um, what do you see that happening? Do you, given the debt ceiling debate and just the weird divisive uh, populist economy uh populist politics that we have what if what if somebody gets crazy and insists that the uh, debt ceiling remain in place and the government can't borrow up to a certain point well and it's we worth pointing out too the debt ceiling is uh meant to fund the government on promises it's already made so it's it's paying its bills, not it's not increasing the debt for future uh, future promises. That's right. The, the Congress has already passed the laws that are allocated spending the money, and so it's, as you say, it's not alloc this debt ceiling has nothing to do with agreeing to spend more money. It's just agreeing that the, the government will pay its bills when they come due. The bills that it's already enacted in law that it would and you know and and agreed to pay it so it, it the debt ceiling should be eliminated and if they want to 
then they should have a debate about, you know, a separate debate about what they want the budget deficit to be, large or small. It's, there should be no debt ceiling limit, in, in my opinion. It just creates this opportunity for a few politicians to bandstand and attract a lot of attention and whip up hype among certain constituencies and uh, cause problems that get the cameras pointed in their direction for a while. Yeah, uh, it, political theater, we call it. Right. So it's it's very harmful and we should stop doing it. It's ridiculous. But how do you encourage the debate about how big or small the deficit should be? Well, that's the debate that we've been having since we had formed a, a country, uh, right? It's a, that's, that is the job of Congress to decide how the money will be spent and how much taxes will be raised to cover that spending. But so from, from my perspective, and, and the main argument that I make in this book, drawing on the lessons of the last 100 years, what should be our policy for the next 10 years? What should we learn from this money revolution that's occurred? And what I conclude is that, look, our economic system is dependent on credit growth. We have to have credit growth to stay out of crisis. And so we are probably going to continue to have growing credit. But if we want to make this thing sustainable over the long run, beyond where Japan has managed to take itself, then we need to spend the money in a, in a wise way. So what I propose in the book is that the US government finance a multi-trillion dollar investment program over the next 10 years, targeting the industries and technologies of, of the future, things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotech, nanotech, robotics, neurosciences, green energy, all the, all the things that would come to mind when you think about new industries and new technologies. And do this in a way that um, it, this could be structured with the US government acting as a big giant venture capital company, forming joint venture companies with the 10,000 most promising American entrepreneurs and scientists, with the government funding these joint venture companies lavishly and keeping a 60% equity stake, and the entrepreneurs and scientists managing these companies and keeping a 40% equity stake. And when one of these very well-funded companies invents a cure for cancer or Alzheimer's disease or you know a chatbot that can write Shakespearean prose as if a dog had, <laughs> had, had conceived it. Um, you list these things on NASDAQ for trillions of dollars and this whole thing pays for itself many times over. And it induces a technological revolution that would turbocharge US productivity and economic growth. And it would keep us out of depression because our credit bubble wouldn't implode. And also importantly, uh, it would ensure that we remain the, the global superpower and are not overtaken by China, which we are just about to be overtaken by. China is now investing more in research and development than the United States does. So if we, we're really in danger that China is going to develop artificial general intelligence before we do, whoever develops artificial general intelligence first then from there, it becomes exponentially more intelligent and they rule the world. And at this rate, well, in the year 2000, the United States invested uh, eight times more in research and development than China did. But in 2019, China overtook the US in R&D investment. And if current growth rates continue 10 years from now in 2031, that year, China will invest 40% more in research and development than the United States does. If we allow that to happen, China is going to control the world. Our national security is at risk because government investment in R&D has been declining decade after decade after decade as the government fell out of favor. Um, and as Americans lost faith in the ability of the government to do anything, they stopped investing the way that they had done 
following the Sputnik crisis in the late 50s. In the, in the 60s, the government invested a lot in R&D and we won the space race. But since then, government investment has declined to very low levels. And now, once again, we're facing a new Sputnik moment where we're about to be overtaken by China. So national security is a very real reason that we desperately need to invest more in research and development. And the government can afford to do this on a multi-trillion dollar scale with financing from the Fed uh, with paper money creation to help finance this at low interest rates. So finally, finally, the main reason though is that I believe we should do this because I call it a moral imperative. It would be so easy for us to finance a multi-trillion dollar investment program over a decade. And it would produce such technological breakthroughs and medical marvels that it would radically enhance human well-being. I mean, really, we have the shot of curing all the diseases and expanding life expectancy by potentially decades. For instance, the National Cancer Institute, their budget is $6 billion a year. That's not curing cancer. Cancer kills 60,000 Americans, 600,000 Americans every year. Six, the budget, $6 billion a year, that's 5% of one month of quantitative easing last year. Last year, quantitative easing, well, 2021, quantitative easing was $120 billion a month. Six billion is 5% of that. Um, Six billion is not curing cancer. If we increase this over a 10 year period in a sensible way, we would really have a shot. I mean, we, you know, by a factor of 10, if 6 billion isn't doing it, let's take this up to 60 billion and that will. And so we have the shot of radically enhancing human well being through an investment program of this type in this new economic environment that has come about after dollars ceased to be backed by gold and we've gone through this money revolution. Just bear in mind this, in three months, in the, in the second quarter of 2020, US government debt rose by $2.8 trillion in three months. And the Fed financed that by creating 2.9 actually trillion dollars in that same three month period. Um, that is a multi-trillion dollar increase in government debt in 90 days. I'm not, and okay, that combined with other problems led to inflation. I'm not talking about a multi-trillion dollar investment program over 90 days. I'm talking about over 10 years. Um, and this is something we, if we can finance $2.8 trillion increase in government debt in one quarter, then just you, obviously we could do that over a 10 year period very easily. Um, and the, the benefits that would accrue to the United States in terms of national security and to humanity as a result of the technological breakthroughs that would result from this are, would be overwhelming. It would lock in US national security for generations to come. And as I said, it, we could cure all diseases. Um, it's worth pointing out too that the 2.8 trillion they created in one quarter was largely uh, targeting the stock market and the credit markets. They are trying to keep those afloat. So that it, in one, one sense, that is unproductive debt. It's simply keeping uh, the status quo where it is. It's keeping the stock market high because people need to use it to retire. Um, and obviously there's influence on Wall Street. They want to get their bonuses. Uh, that money that they created in one quarter flows right into the banking system, right up, right onto Wall Street. Um, that's not an investment in the future. That is preserving uh, the status quo, or it's preserving what was expected, you know, three or four years ago in in the pandemic, as we were going through a, a kind of bullish phase in the markets in like 2017, 2018. Right. Uh, that Especially that first three-month period that we're talking about, that did stop the stock market from spiraling downward, and it's very quickly recovered. But that altogether, the government borrowing and the Fed financing of the government borrowing was necessary to send out the stimulus checks. They it, Once they decided to send the stimulus checks, I think the stimulus was $5 trillion in total during the pandemic, uh, just direct um, pandemic stimulus. And 
had the Fed not created the money to finance that, I think they financed about 70% of it with money creation, then the government would have had to borrow the money and that would have pushed interest rates to much higher levels, the government borrowing. And the higher interest rates then would have done even more damage to the economy perhaps than the stimulus was doing good. And so it, it was necessary for the Fed and the government were acting uh, as partners to make this stimulus program possible in a way that would keep interest rates low, they, they thought. And um, that's what happened. Um, but you're making a different argument if they um, if they were willing to spend that money in order to prevent the economy from collapsing, uh, households from collapsing, the stock market from collapsing, uh, they ought to be able to put it together to invest in infrastructure and uh, not infrastructure in the traditional sense, but R&D and new technologies that uh, that will help spur the economy on. That's right. That's how to finance the next American century. That's the subtitle of the book. Money revolution has occurred. It has created a new economic environment where the government can, as we've seen, run trillion dollar budget deficits. The Fed can finance those trillion dollar budget deficits up until the pandemic and get away with it without causing any inflation. Now we've had an inflation problem for the last couple of years, but that seems to be going away. Uh, and given that that's the environment we now find ourselves in, and particularly since we are in a system that requires credit growth essentially to survive, then this is our best option going forward. If we have to keep the credit expanding, we must have the government borrow and invest it in new industries and new technologies that will generate a lot of growth and a lot of technological benefits for everyone. Are you concerned that um, that rising national debt or rising deficits year over year and then piling onto the debt, are you concerned that that uh, diminishes or even um, crushes the dollar's purchasing power? Um, not so much. Um, because all the other countries are essentially doing the same thing. You know, sometimes if you're if we're talking about against other currencies, then I'm not worried that the dollar is going to collapse against the euro and the yen. But over time, the dollar will continue to depreciate against hard assets like land and and, and other hard assets, and probably including gold. Although I I prefer land over gold. But I don't think it's going to crash against the yen because and the euro. For, for instance, here are some interesting stats. If you look at the Fed's total assets, which represent how much money they've created as a percent of the United States economy, GDP, the Fed's total assets to GDP are 35% uh, of the US GDP. The Euro's total, Eurozone's total assets are almost twice that much, 70% of GDP. And Japan's, the Bank of Japan's total assets are nearly four times that much, 130% of GDP. So we're actually the laggard in, in this money creation game relative to the Eurozone and Japan. So this suggests we, we can take this considerably further before, before becoming, before it won't work. Do you ever and get- I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe, you know, I'm not saying, this window of opportunity that I'm discussing right now, it won't stay open forever. Something will go wrong one day. And we've, we've had a taste of that over the last two years uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Who expected that? If we have a big war, then globalization will go into full retreat and we'll be back in the sort of 1960s, 1970s America, where once again, we'll have a closed domestic economy and if we spend too much and print too much, it will lead to very high rates of inflation and be very harmful. Uh, so globalization could collapse, but let's look on the bright side and hope for the best and take advantage of it for as long as it lasts. And who knows what sort of breakthroughs uh, we can achieve in the meantime, and, and who knows how much further we can shore up US national security, make, making hay while the sun shines. Do you ever get concerned, this is another libertarian question, do you ever get concerned that by having um, those massive deficits 
and a growing debt and a reliance on the Fed to manage the interest rate. Do you ever get concerned that the um, the wheels of the economy are in the hands of too few people? It's very undemocratic to think of of just a you know the board of governors of the Fed having the kind of power that they do over the world's reserve currency. It's a small number of people making decisions that impact really the entire population of the planet. Do you ever get concerned about that? Well, so. You know, I, I think that is not unique to our age. If you look back at the age of J.P. Morgan, when he himself yeah. acted as the uh, lender of last resort that prevented the crisis of two, uh, 1907 from creating a Great Depression, you know, power has been concentrated in a few individuals' hands from the beginning of civilization. But capitalism started going off track as you referred to earlier with World War I, when the gold standard broke down in Europe. Uh, the Europe went to war, the European nations didn't have enough gold to fight the war. So they started printing a lot of, they went off the gold standard, started printing a lot of money. And that created a worldwide credit bubble that blew up into the 1930s. Then we had the New Deal. The depression didn't end until World War II started. And then the US government had massive government spending. And that government spending is the thing that finally ended the Great Depression. But that was enormous government spending and enormous money creation by the Fed. And it's never gone back. Uh, we, won, we won the two wars and we won the Cold War. Um, but it, it, at the cost of capitalism and laissez-faire, this we haven't had laissez-faire for you know a century. So the way I look at it is we just have to take the system as it is now and make sure we don't let it collapse. Understand how it works and make the most of it and understand that it's driven by credit. If credit contracts, we have a big depression. If So we have to find a way to keep it growing. Now, you can condemn this as an awful thing, as a, as a sin that we must be punished for as the, you know, the hardcore Austrians do. Since our day of judgment is inevitable, the sooner it arises, the better, the sooner we suffer, the better, and it will all be over in a year or two, and then we'll be back into some sort of laissez-faire Garden of Eden. No, that is, if this bubble pops, we're talking about a civilization-destroying uh, event. It will be a fall of Rome type scenario. There was a recovery after the fall of Rome. It just took a thousand years. That's not what we want. We've got to take this economic system we have now, learn how it works, and make the most of it. And my proposal on how to make the most of it is to have the government finance and let the private sector carry out a multi-trillion dollar investment program over the next decade, targeting the most promising industries and technologies of the future. Um, currently, the Fed is uh, in a multi-year study of uh, at uh, the advent of what we call the Fed coin, a cryptocurrency that makes uh, makes the dollar, the U.S. dollar, more efficient. That's their goal. Um, they're already just, I mean, when they expand the, the money supply, they already just deposit digits in banks' accounts, and then they redeposit it in the Fed as a way to store their own reserves. Um, so it's already a kind of electronic system. Uh, the idea of the Fed coin is that it would just be more efficient if we were using blockchain technology. Do you see that happening anytime soon? I know that I've been trying to follow the um, the studies that come out. They're very, just like any government entity, they study it to death uh, before they make any decisions. And maybe that's a good thing because we don't want to move too fast on a, on a uh, you know, a digital currency. Um do you think that that will make it more efficient? And also the conspiracy theories uh, abound that it will also give the power of uh, the Fed or the government, um, it give them the power to regulate what you actually choose to spend your money on. I've heard that theory on the Wigan sessions a number of times, like if you, I don't know, the one that always sticks to my mind, people always use this for an example. If you drink too much wine, the next time you go to the liquor store, they just say, nope, you can't buy that. <laughs> Steer to my heart. Um, well, 
Um, right. I, don't, I don't know. I don't believe the conspiracy theories, but I w just wanted to get your opinion on it because we we do talk about the dollar all the time. And then if it if it moves in, this would be another iteration of the money revolution. Well, you know, I don't really consider myself an expert on on that topic about the digital central central bank currencies. My impression, though, is that they're really reluctant to do that. They're not keen to rush into that at all because they like the way they like the control that they have at the moment with the dollar being the global reserve currency and they're afraid of doing anything that might might mess that up so i think they're going to take their time and think about this very carefully and probably drag their feet uh, and are happy to see big setbacks to the whole crypto space when companies like uh, sam bankman breeds blow up um, so i don't think they're going to rush into that and, you know, I'm not so concerned, you know, I don't live in the United States, so maybe our liberties there are being eroded very rapidly. But from what I hear, you can't walk down the streets in Manhattan these days without inhaling a whole lot of marijuana smoke, which is a new liberty the Americans seem to have obtained in recent years. So I'm not really sure what liberties are being lost or are under threat, but um, that's my perspective from afar. I may be totally misguided. Well, I don't, I, as I see it, I don't think, you know, I don't view the government as full of a lot of evil people trying to do bad things. I see it as full of a lot of Americans who are in difficult jobs. They've inherited problems and they're trying to sort these problems out in the best way possible so that our country can prosper. Yeah, but yeah. there is the... the... There is the They're under a lot of pressure from lobbyists and you know, all kinds of different people who are pushing them in different directions. And some of them are, you know, end up being making bad decisions for bad reasons. Um, but hopefully the democratic process will work that out over time and the right decisions can be reached. But I don't think there's a big conspiracy to you know, screw the American public. And uh, uh, no, I'm not in that camp at all. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just. I think I'm just naturally skeptical that good decisions do get made. <laughs> um, and also, I I am a firm believer in the adage that well, there's two that I like. Uh, no good deed goes unpunished, and the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> so I think that applies to a large chunk of uh, bureaucracy. But that's just my camp. Um, how can readers get your your uh, your monthly video and maybe describe what you do uh, in the monthly video so uh, people well, can decide whether they want to sign up or whatever? Well, great. Thanks you for giving me that opportunity. Just one more comment. Um, you know, when I made these proposals in the past, I've been talking about this government and in, in financed investment program for a number of years now. In the past, people would always say, "Well, that's." an interesting idea, but you know the government is never, ever, ever going to do anything like that. Well, actually now, as of last year, the government has begun to do something exactly like that. They've passed the Chips and Science Act, which is a $280 billion investment in new industries and technologies, with 50, <laughs> 50 billion being allocated to building semiconductor factories inside the United States, and the remainder of the $280 billion being invested in things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and all the other things that I listed earlier, the industries of the future. So this is a big first step in the right direction. And it shows that this can, these sorts of thing programs can get through the US government. But 280 billion, okay, it is a good first step in the right direction. It would have taken about two months of quantitative easing to pay for the entire Chips and Science Act. And 280 billion will keep us you know, a few steps ahead of China. It may buy us maybe two more years of uh, being in, ahead of China, but it's not going to it's not going to keep us ahead of China for very long. We need to be thinking in terms of trillions, not billions, if we are going to retain control of our own destiny and not be, let me say it frankly, conquered by China in the not too distant future, because that's the path we're on right now. Now, turning to, you know the. The first American century doesn't have to be the last, but it will be if we don't radically alter 
our approach toward investing in new industries and technologies, because this is like the, the 1930s when Churchill was warning his countrymen that the Nazis were rearming and were going to attack them and take over Europe. He argued for years and years, England needed to rearm. But this is a similar sort of situation. Our national security is now under threat because we are underinvesting, not in the military directly, but in the industries that underpin the military and all future technologies. So this is something everybody needs to think about. You may not like the government, but you're going to dislike the Chinese government a whole lot more than you dislike the American government. Um, how much? Uh, I, I just have a, a short question on that. Um, how much of the if, if uh, government spending in R and D is going down? How much of that is made up for in the private sector? R and D, like in uh, like the, uh, big pharma, for example, those budgets are massive, and they're, they're all privately funded through um, through the stock market mostly. But the the R and D for drugs and uh, a lot of the technology is uh, in private hands. How much of that has increased as government uh, investment in R&D has gone down? So there are three, they break R&D into three categories, basic research and development, um, sort of applied development, I think, that, no, um, experimental development, and then uh, applied development. And businesses focus on the latter two, because those are the ones that more quickly generate products and, and profits. But it's the basic research that needs the funding from the, the government, the financing from the government, because that's where all the basic fundamental breakthroughs come from. And the corporations tend to focus more on the experimental development, which actually, you know, of course, that's their job is to make profits and to invest in profitable things not to do the fundamental basic research that actually then 10 or 20 years down the road creates a new wave of innovations and that Schumpeter referred to, ways of innovation driving the economy. So the government row is more on financing the, the basic research and development. And that's where the, the private sector falls short. All right, let us know how uh, we can uh, get your video newsletter, Macro Trends. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so for nine years now, I've been making a video newsletter that I call Macro Watch. And every couple of weeks, I upload a new video uh, discussing something happening in the global economy and how that's likely to impact asset prices, stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies. Now, since the Fed plays in recent years plays such an important role in what happens to the markets, I do pay a lot of attention on what the Fed is doing. For example, during most of 2021, one of the big themes recurring through Macro Watch was the liquidity tsunami. It was pushing asset prices higher with the Fed creating $120 billion a month and pumping it into the markets. It's not at all surprising the markets went up. But when the Fed started signaling that it was going to taper, and then Macro Watch turned bearish because when the Fed is creating money, it's Asset prices tend to go up. And when the Fed is destroying money, as it is now through quantitative tightening and rate hikes, asset prices tend to go down. So there's a lot of focus on what the Fed is doing, but it also looks at the other central banks. It looks at a wide variety of macroeconomic issues and how they are likely to impact the, the asset markets. And it explains how the economy really works now. The classical economic theory was all constructed on the founding premise that gold was money. And everything else in classical economic theory was built on that understanding. But when gold stopped being money, the economy now works in a very different way than it did before. So MacroWatch strives to explain how the economy really works today so that subscribers can make more informed and better investment decisions for themselves and actually understand what's going on around them. So I hope your audience will visit my website, which is richardduncaneconomics.com. And if they'd like to subscribe, hit the subscribe button. And I'd like to offer them a 50% subscription discount. If they type in the discount coupon code February, like February, they can subscribe at 50% off. So that's richardduncaneconomics.com. Take a look and at the very least, sign up to my free blog while you're there. I hope you'll check it out.
All right. Thank you, Richard. It was great talking to you today. Thank you, Edison. Great seeing you. Let's let's do this again before too long. And thank you for your gentle treatment of my non-Austrian <laughs> economic views. <laughs> hey, I learned a lot from these uh, these interviews, so um, I appreciate uh, you coming on and helping me with a new perspective. Well, the economy doesn't work the way it did in the past, and you know every generation has to overcome the challenges that it inherits. And we've got to do that now. We Yes, we have challenges and we've got to overcome them. All right. Thank you, Richard. If you'd like to follow Richard's work, you can do so by signing up for MacroWatch, a bi-weekly video newsletter. You can find MacroWatch at richardduncaneconomics.com. That's Richard Duncan economics.com. And if you hit subscribe on the website and use the promo code February, you'll get a 50% discount. That's promo code February, the month, and spell it right. It's F-E-B-R-U-A-R-Y. It's a mistake I always make. <laughs> Richard set up the discount, 50% discount, just for Wigan Sessions viewers and listeners. So if you want to take advantage of Richard's insights, you could do so at a 50% discount by using promo code February. I hope you enjoyed today's session. If you did, let your friends know, send them to jointhesessions.com. That's jointhesessions.com. Let's jam. Mm -hmm.